Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, this Civic University Network Conference closing session on uh, the importance of the Civic University Network in place-based strategy. I'm Richard Calvert. Uh, I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at Sheffield Hallam University, and I'll be the host for this session. Just before we get started, uh, one or two housekeeping messages. Uh, firstly, to say this webinar will be recorded and it will be made available after the conference through the network members area. Um, I think as those of you who've been in session so far will be very familiar with now, you can use the chat function throughout the session for any general comments or discussion, uh, but please do make sure that you, uh, you send any, any chat to all panelists and attendees. Um, if you do have a question, and I'm sure there will be lots of questions as we get into the discussion, uh, could you put your questions into the Q&A function rather than the chat function, uh, which you'll find on the bottom toolbar? And just finally, um, could you uh, adjust your video settings if necessary to uh, hide non-video participants? I think this will give you a, a better viewing experience and the instructions on how to do that will be pasted into the chat. So that's all the housekeeping. Um, I'm really delighted to be joined for this session by uh, a distinguished panel who I know are going to bring uh, a really interesting range of perspectives and challenges to this discussion as we think about the role of this network and its members in place-based strategy. I'll introduce the panel in a couple of minutes, but I'd just like to say a few things first to help to set the scene for the discussion. I think it's been, by any standards, a, a pretty extraordinary year, uh, certainly not the year that we expected when we first bid to host the Civic University Network in early 2020. And I guess it's been a year in which the civic mission and role of universities could easily have become lost, uh, as within our institutions we've had to turn so much around and change so many ways of working, uh, but also that um, partners have also been uh, fundamentally rethinking business models. But in fact, I think we've seen the opposite over the last year, as the civic role and importance of universities right across the UK uh, has become even more critical. And that's partly been in relation to uh, response to the pandemic and managing this, this, this very difficult period. But also, as we all start to think about longer term social and economic recovery, and I think we've seen that criticality of universities evidenced both in the growth of this network now more than 70% of the HE sector are, are members of the network. We've seen it in the strength uh, and the novelty of some of the partnerships which universities have been building uh, beyond the HE sector. But also, and this is really at the heart of what the civic movement is all about, the activity that's making a real difference at a local level in so many parts of the country. And I think we've also seen that, that range reflected uh, in the discussions we've had over this last three days of, of conference, but also the huge amount of enthusiasm and energy which there is behind this agenda. But I think what we've also seen, and, and we also know from our own experience, is that you know, th th this is challenging making a real difference and sustaining a real difference uh, in terms of civic impact is, is not easy. Um, there's lots we can learn from each other, uh, but there'll be challenges ahead. Places are different, relationships we know are often complex, uh, and turning aspirations for a coherent place-based strategy into reality is perhaps one of the biggest political and societal challenges of the next few years. So what I hope we're going to do in this session is to uh, explore some of the ways in which we can perhaps start to unravel some of that complexity, but also think about how can we maximise the contribution uh, of the network and of its members. So I'm joined for this session uh, by four panellists, uh, Professor Dame Nancy Rothwell, the President and Vice-Chancellor of the University of Manchester, Professor Mary Stewart, the Vice-Chancellor of the University of Lincoln, David Sweeney, the Executive Chair of Research England, and Dr. Omar Khan, the Director of the Centre for Transforming Access and Student Outcomes in HD. So I'm going to uh, invite each of the panellists to speak for five or six minutes at the beginning, just to give their perspectives on some of the big challenges that face universities in taking forward their civic mission. Uh, and then we'll open it up to questions uh, and discussion, and then we'll close just with a few final thoughts from uh, each panel member. 
So I'm going to start by uh, handing over to, uh, to Nancy Rothwell. So Nancy, um, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. I wanted to make three brief points today. I'm not sure they're provocations, but we shall see. Uh, building on the experience of working together between the five universities in Greater Manchester in developing what we think might be one of the biggest civic university agreements. Uh, it will be published in the summer and will be collectively delivered with um, the Greater Manchester Combined Authority potentially impacting on three million residences. And the three brief points are about the benefits of working in partnership, working with the public, and working towards existing place-based strategies. So on partnerships, uh, Lord Kerslake, of course, set out uh, that our civic university agreement should be developed with local partners. And we can see many of these developing across England, partnerships with the local authorities, with NHS trusts, with, with the private sector. And a few, uh, including Greater Manchester, have chosen to partner with each other. Now, this is one of perhaps rather few uh, positive outcomes of the pandemic, because from the very week of lockdown, the five universities in Greater Manchester, Manchester Metropolitan University, the Royal Northern College of Music, the University of Bolton, the University of Manchester and the University of Salford, all vice chancellors have met every week, barring a couple of instances. And we've looked at what we can do together. We've shared problems, we've shared challenges, and we've shared solutions. And so we decided that we would develop a, a joined up uh, across all of us civic university agreement with Greater Manchester Combined Authority. Um, so I guess the first thought is whether or not it should become the norm rather than the exception for universities to work together in a region. And can our differences as institutions, act, when combined, act as a strength to coordinate our efforts? My point on working with the public concerns how our civic engagement needs to be informed by public sentiment across all of our communities. We're used to engaging with this, with patients, older people, young people and so on. And a lot of us have general assemblies and boards that offer us lay perspectives. But uh, we wanted a wider engagement. Uh, Greater Manchester includes two cities, Manchester and Salford and 51 towns and a huge diversity of views of prosperity and of activity. So we commissioned Public First to poll well over a thousand residents um, to find out what they thought about our universities, what we should do and what we shouldn't do. Uh, that's being released today. Uh, much of it was very positive. 79% think we're important in making our region a better place to live. 71% of our residents say they're proud in the role we play. And they also told us about their priorities, tackling inequalities, improving health, environment, job quality, and asked specifically about what we do well. Most commonly, they said our role in training professionals in public services, doctors, engineers, nurses, teachers, and as economic an anchors. But they also told us what we need to do better. Um, and obviously there was different engagement in different parts of the city. Those in the city center, uh, and the more educated valued us much more than some in the towns. And so we're now working through a programme of what we can do, do to address uh, those suggestions that were raised by our participants. And then the third point, responding to existing strategies. Um, there is a need for us to get better at working back from the existing local authority and our local enterprise partnership strategies into our areas rather than reinventing new sets of priorities ourselves. I think close engagement with those organisations is going to be ever more important. In other words, we need to get better at starting from uh, the outside in rather than the inside out. If I could leave you with um, a concern or a pressure, I think that's that we must remember what universities are for and what they're good for. We are public institutions. We are there for public benefit. That is, has to be our key mission. Most of that is delivered through our research, our generation of knowledge and its application, our education of students. But of course, we all do very much more. But what we cannot do is be the sole solution to all of societal problems. And there are times when we need to push back and say, it's just not within our gift to solve all aspects of educational differences, of poverty, of inequalities, of economic growth, although we can help to contribute to them. So finally, we hope um, the polling that we're sharing today uh, contributes something new and helps to prompt conversations about how, how universities can respond more to their local residents. 
we can all learn from each other and that's why the Civic University Network is so helpful. Um, so do look out for our polling results today uh, and also for our Civic University Agreement, which will be published in the summer in partnership with our elected mayor and our combined authority. Thank you. Nancy, thank you very much. And, and I think you are absolutely setting the bar in terms of a really inclusive CUA, which, um, which we're all watching with a lot of interest. Not all of us are managing quite such a broad partnership in our CUA, but um, it, it's, it's a terrific model. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing how it progresses. OK, I'm going to come next to, uh, to David. Uh, David, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to pick up from uh, from Nancy in a way that we didn't plan at all, uh, but has has naturally happened. Let me start by just saying, as somebody who uh, isn't now in a university, I'm absolutely full of admiration for what you've done over the last year. You haven't had, in my view, uh, the approval, uh, the thanks, and the praise that's due you, and and I understand why that might be. Uh, but I want to tell you that the work you've done in caring for your students and in working with your partners is, uh, to my view, unparalleled in recent experience and uh, a real tribute uh, to university leadership, but to also uh, their staff. Uh, I'm pleased to be here talking about place because in one, in one respect, and, and we might talk about uh, other respects, in one respect, uh, Civic is, is place. It's about uh, the impact that universities make in their community. That's an enormous concern for Research England in supporting uh, as far as we possibly can uh, all of the higher education institutions in England. And also uh, with our contribution to the work in Bayes on the levelling up and place agenda uh, in UK RI. Uh, what we want to do, and I, I'm mostly talking today about the Research England view of the world, what we want to do is to stimulate action, uh, but also stimulate thinking. Uh, today, some uh, work we funded uh, with the Mile End Institute and the local government, in, uh, local government information uh, unit has produced a, a report on the needs of local places. The time is right for a radical restructuring of power politics and policy around the needs of local places. Now, that's not influenced by what we think. Indeed, we're a funder, uh, so uh, we're not endorsing it either, but it's, it is. We are endorsing the need to think about these things and to push through to, I think, a better understanding of what we're attempting to do uh, both individually and collectively. Uh, picking up from Nancy, one of the things that uh, I guess, to be honest, annoys me is that everybody wants a bit of universities, as I would put it, uh, and more particularly think that their bits are uh, the most important thing going. And I'm seeing that in government at the moment as we go through uh, I, I'm really pleased. Uh, our first real thought uh, under the current uh, government of what the priorities should be. I think we're moving forward. Uh, but of course, every bit of the government wants uh, to use universities as the exemplar of how they can take their agenda forward. But their uh, universities can only do so much. Thanks, Nancy, for making a point I was about to make. Uh, the most critical factor we are told in uh, the substantial amount of survey work we've done is a shortage of academic time. And that feeds over, of course, into cost in that if you're not teaching, somebody's got to teach. I spent four years of my life trying to uh, sort that out in, in a university. Uh, there's um, a set of different benefits to those who are uh, undertaking the work. Uh, and that's not just uh, decisions that Nancy takes. I don't believe she controls absolutely everything that happens at the University of Manchester. In fact, universities are not strongly managed institutions. Uh, we rightly give a good degree of autonomy and authority to our academics to take decisions. Uh, well, to be fair, also uh, setting some uh, direction, but in fact from the government and of course from university uh, leadership. All of that has to be balanced by all of our staff effectively. They've got to assess, of course, the personal benefits there are, because everybody is, uh, is act, uh, encouraged by that, uh, the importance as they see it across the varying thinking themselves and in the institution uh, that there is, uh, costs, uh, benefits and importance. Uh, and I think the key to success in a civic agenda is how you align with some of those other stakeholders. I was slightly, well, I was interested in the work that uh, Professor Rodriguez from LSE uh, talked about, indicating that uh, 
uh, that having a big research focus perhaps undermined the contribution you could make to your, uh, your local place. Now, at one level, I agree with that. Our work with the Knowledge Exchange Framework uh, shows that a, a greater proportion of the university effort in uh, not so research obsessed institution go goes on place uh, than in the big uh, research universities. Uh, but that to me is a good thing. That is mission diversity in action and mission complementarity. It's not a problem. The press all assumed it was a problem and the Russell group as it were in their terms should just change what they do. I think that represents a strength of our sector and we should celebrate it. I, I also think that though that is true in proportionate terms, if you look in absolute terms about what universities do, you get a slightly different picture. I, I think I've spent more time talking to Nancy about her commitment to Manchester and the region than I have around some of her big research projects, although uh, they too we are fun to, and I'm interested in. And, and things like the Patterson play, of course, to both uh, agendas. So I, I, and just to give you again uh, uh, an example that's not so trite, uh, Oxford University is wonderful and, and viewed as a certain kind of institution. If you wanted an exemplar of student entrepreneurship, go and visit them. They've got that one cracked. So I think pigeonholing universities is not good. I think universities are perfectly capable of playing uh, to multiple agendas. And to get the most on the place agenda, we've got to appropriately align with what they see as important in those agendas. Particularly, we shouldn't get into the trap of trashing other agendas or unduly challenging them. Uh, Global Britain has come out and I think makes very clear the government's uh, sense that universities as global actors is at the heart of our research system. Now, I know we've had some really tough comments because of the ODA decisions, uh, but governments do different things at the same time, which don't always support each other. And that shouldn't cause us to do anything other than understand how we can work best with the things that are on a roll and manage the things that are not on a roll. Global Britain is important. We shouldn't be encouraging our universities uh, to play that directly off against a civic and local agenda. It's great to me that two of our most important universities in acoustics are Salford and Southampton. Different kinds of universities. Would I want to suppress uh, the, well, both the infrastructure and uh, the expertise there is at Salford so that they become a more civic agenda. Just not sensible. In art and design, Leeds are fabulous, but so are Manchester Met. Do we want, again, to pigeonhole? Uh, I think there are opportunities for those institutions in different places to do stuff that is distinctive in their place, and all the better if it's founded on work that also carries other methods of approval. So let's look to support mission diversity and to support alignment between different uh, objectives. I think that is the context in which we must come to levelling up. It is right that we have to do things differently to address the levelling up agenda. I'm not trying to suggest that we have perfect mission diversity. We need to invest more in providing appropriate research capacity in places to address uh, issues that are more local. That's in many ways a reversal of the concentration agenda. But I think that is where the place uh, agenda is going. Uh, we need to look harder at national operators like myself, understanding better the, the issues and challenges that are locally and thinking about how we can address multiple objectives uh, through our funding. Uh, Strength in Places, uh, the, the Our Place scheme is a direct example of where we're at narrowing in particularly on business and university collaboration. But I also think there are big research projects where we've not appropriately captured some of the local spillovers and benefits. And in our decision taking, uh, we should do that. So I think the place agenda should be taken forward uh, by uh, civics balancing up their local responsibility rather than setting it off against other agendas. I think there's oodles of effort in the Civic University Network to do that. I think the network has moved on tremendously. I'm, I'm really happy that we're able uh, to work with you. And I look forward 
uh, to more look forward uh, to discussion about how all this plays out now. Thank you. David, thank you, and, and, and lots there that I'm, I'm sure we'll pick up uh, in the discussion, um, but that's great. Um, let me go next to, uh, to Omar. Omar, over to you. Thank you. Thank you for the invite and, um, uh, and for this discussion. I'm going to make four points uh, in my introductory comments. Uh, they're comments, I think, that resonate with what Nancy and David have just said. Uh, first, I thought I'd explain who Tezo is. So uh, Tezo's full name, as you said it, Richard, is the Center for Transforming Access and Student Outcomes in Higher Education. It's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, we are a what works center. Uh, that's a particular approach to policymaking um, that focuses on ensuring that uh, interventions are having the uh, intended uh, outcome, uh, particularly causal uh, evidence. Uh, we were set up by the Office for Students uh, by a consortium of King's College London the Behavioral Insights team and Nottingham Trent University, uh, but we've now spun out as an independent charity as of 1st of April. We're here to support the sector uh, in what works in tackling inequalities that students experience in higher education. And I think those two aspects of our work, uh, a focus on what works and on tackling student inequality gaps, that's framing my uh, points here today in terms of understanding the role of the Civic University Network in place-based strategy. So a bit more focus, I suppose, on, on students, but I think it's I, I think that that will resonate with with I think a lot of uh, the speakers and 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 those participating today, because that's obviously the ultimate aim of uh, a civic university. So my second point, however, is that we actually have limited evidence in terms of what works on some of the high-level economic questions that are currently animating uh, the focus on place-based strategies, uh, and in particular, how best to tackle various inequalities of class, region, and economic performance that have existed in Britain for many decades, but also look likely to impact ne negatively on the next cohort of young people, whether they attend um, HE or not. I think from a university perspective, a civic university perspective, a key question is whether widening participation and increasing the proportion of people who intend higher education from low participation neighborhoods will indeed lead to or cause better economic opportunity per and performance in those neighborhoods. So will the participation rate increasing in itself lead to economic opportunity? Or conversely, whether the causal story goes the other way around, that increased economic investment, opportunity, and performance in a locality leads to increasing demands for graduates, which universities uh, can then help fulfill. And I think that also speaks uh, to Nancy's point that it might not be that universities can do everything that we need um, you know, other actors uh, to address economic inequalities. My third point I think is that we need to be clear about our level or area of analysis when we're talking about local or indeed place-based strategies. Uh, this isn't just, I don't think a question of definition. What do we mean by a local area? Um, it's also in terms of our policy and practice response. What kind of uh, interventions we, we then uh, develop and assess in terms of local-based uh, strategies. Regional inequalities in the UK are among the worst in Europe. Uh, and while countries such as Germany have made striking progress in tackling such inequalities, and I say striking because uh, 30 years ago, the regional inequalities between East and West Germany were far greater than those in most European countries. And they've now narrowed to be much less than those in the UK in just those three decades. And in Britain, those same patterns of regional equality have persisted with London in the Southeast significantly outperforming the rest of the country on various economic measures. If we look at regions though, internally, however, the inequalities in the Southeast look at least as worrying and sticky as those in the Northwest. So the biggest gaps, for example, in the proportion of free school meal and non-free school meals, uh, people attending university are in some of the wealthiest parts of Britain, uh, particularly the Southeast in Berkshire. Um, so clearly a place-based approach that simply seeks to level up the Northeast to the Southeast overall economic performance, or indeed university participation rates, won't necessarily tackle those wider inequalities of class that people experience in whatever locality they live in Britain. And this week, of course, saw the publication of statistics showing that child poverty is continuing to rise, but also I think why leveling up local places is unlikely to be a full solution to that poverty. So the highest rates of child poverty overall are still in London and, London and Birmingham, where over half of children are living in poverty in a number of constituencies. But on the other hand, the largest increases in child poverty were in a mix of other places. Some were in areas that we now refer to as the blue or red wall shorthand, Hartlepool, Redcar, Cleveland, Tyneside. But the largest increases in child poverty over the last few years were also seen in our biggest cities, Leicester, Leeds, Manchester, Birmingham, and Bradford. 
that's a lot of the country that needs leveling up, or rather a lot of children living in poverty in lots of places across the country. My fourth and last point is that universities both need to do more and be aware of their limitations. I think that seemingly contradictory advice is based on the fact that universities both have an obligation uh, as public bodies, as Nancy said, to do more to, and to do more to support lo local areas, to engage with local people. But they also have a duty to their students and to their staff, to their students to provide them with the opportunities and experiences to benefit from higher education. Furthermore, uh, there are institutions in an area who are likely better placed to support local economic performance and opportunity, or to build bridges across communities where there is division, or to offer physical spaces in which local people are most comfortable to interact as equals. That's not always the university lecture hall. There's also the reality that universities are in fact typically located in particular spaces or localities, and that stretch budgets may mean engaging even in the most proximate cities, towns and villages are beyond the capacity or expertise of many universities. I, here I'm gonna conclude by highlighting the need for a very wide range of partnerships across the student life cycle, both as part of a university's pace-based strategy, but also to address the inequalities that Tezo and of course the sector is focused on. So looking at access, there's much work already being done uh, to connect universities with local schools and colleges, though I think this needs better evaluation of what's actually working. In terms of retention and progression, most universities are aware of the need for belonging and how disadvantaged and underrepresented students are less likely to feel they fit in certain HE cultures and practices. It's important and necessary for universities to ensure they are welcoming places for everyone, regardless of their background. But they should also think about how, say, mature students, as well as young people, connect to their local community or place in different various ways and how they already interact with a range of institutions and networks outside the university campus. Finally, most civic university partners have strong links with employers. In thinking about further developing those links, it is vital that HE providers focus both on what actually works in achieving better student outcomes in a local labor market and ensuring that those outcomes don't reinforce but instead tackling existing inequalities. After all, while universities should be civic, they also need to provide a positive experience and outcome for every student, whatever their background, whatever local place they come from, and whichever local place they end up. In other words, an effective civic agenda needs also to be a tackling inequality agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. And again, lots, lots to uh, react to in the discussions. So I'm going to move on um, now to, uh, to Mary to um, conclude the, uh, the initial comments. Thank you very much, Richard. And hello, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. And how fabulous to see this conference happening and how much engagement there's been with all of it. Um, I, I, I think the panel has been coming at this from lots of different perspectives. And, and I think I might bring a, a, a slightly different one as well. Um, I'm speaking not only as being VC at the University of Lincoln, but as being a UPP Foundation trustee. Um, I, I was uh, working with um, Richard Bramber um, uh, as a trustee of the foundation when the idea of uh, doing a civic university commission uh, came up. And it is fabulous to see how that work, that thought leadership that came out of UPP Foundation has turned into this fantastic network and um, uh, congratulations to the team who've been working on uh, that network. And it's fabulous to see uh, the civic uh, agreements coming forward um, in the way that Nancy was describing. And they are hard. They're damn hard to get right. Um, uh, because, of course, you're working across uh, different cultures, uh, different priorities, um, uh, a lack of trust sometimes, it's not easy doing all of that. Uh, that's uh, a, a real challenge, but it is the beginning of a, an important conversation to work across HE and FE, uh, to work with um, your local authorities, uh, and indeed other players like um, your business improvement groups and, and the like that you, you might have in, in your place. For me, this is all about developing places together, um, it's about learning from others because quite rightly, we don't know everything in universities um, and we don't lead on everything and neither should we. But the fabulous thing about working in a whole systems approach across health, 
local authorities, business, cultural organizations, community groups, um, schools and colleges, working across all of that, is that we learn things about our place, however you choose to define that, um, and, and we get better at what we do. Um, uh, my university is has the privilege of being young enough to still have some of our fa founding fathers and mothers alive. It's a remarkable, um, a remarkable uh, challenge to us to have to pay attention to those people who chose to establish the University of Lincoln because Lincoln was a city that was dying in a region that is very rural and with a very long coastal strip, um, which was also uh, being challenged and dying. Um, and the, the solution that uh, the local authorities had and the business community had was to establish a university. I'm sure my other colleagues um, uh, in, involved in this session will know that for many people at the moment, the solution is to have a university. And, and certainly some of our other uh, district councils keep coming to us and say, well, what you've done at Lincoln, can you come and do it with us in Skagness, in, 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 in Scunthorpe, uh, 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 wherever? And as, as Nancy quite rightly said, you can't do everything. However, you do need to work with uh, uh, your colleagues and support them wherever you can. And, and I think for me, one of the things that we as a network can do, and one of the opportunities that the network have is to share, and obviously conferences like this help us uh, with that. I am lucky enough to have been trained in, in working with um, uh, different organizations, and, and, and I'm very sensitive to that whole thing of different cultures. The importance of getting on the table as soon as you can, what people's different agendas are and what their priorities are, because every organization will have different priorities and you need to bring those to the table and be open about that and make sure everyone can benefit uh, from those discussions. Um, at, at Lincoln, uh, one of the things we've done is very much work from the outside in. So for example, our research strategy, which I will um, uh, not uh, uh, plagiarize now, but I will, will actually say where I learned this from, but it is copying, um, is actually from the University of San Diego, um, from a fellow uh, uh, sociologist, Mary Walshock, who um, worked uh, with the, 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 the way that San Diego, the way she describes it, she worked with the assets of the area in order to develop the specialisms in their research. Uh, and that's exactly uh, what we've done at Lincoln. We've looked at what there is in our region and we've responded to the needs of that, starting local and going global. And the example I would give of that is our Agri-Food Technology Institute, um, which is, is now globally recognized but started from local needs within our agriculture and food in environment. And, and so, you know, I completely agree with David um, that different universities have different missions. And this is a particular way of focusing research in a particular area. I, I also think one of the things that we as universities can really benefit from in learning from other organizations in our place is to help us with our diversity and inclusion agendas. You know, within place, there are many organizations that are further ahead and are better at diversity and inclusion than universities are. And so, you know, we were asked to, to give some kind of a provocation. So that's one of mine. How are you learning from people who are better uh, at, at, at some of the agendas which we have within our um, organizations? How are you learning from them and benefiting from their experience? So partnership working is hard, but actually, actually, 
we can benefit from it. Uh, and that's that's the 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 the, the win-win, if you like, um, that 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 is possible uh, in, in this environment. Uh, my second and, and final provocation goes to something Omar was talking about. Um, the issue, and, and Nancy mentioned from their research they did uh, with Public First, the issue of, of how universities are uh, used um, uh, and perceived uh, by people within, within their place. Um, and, and, you know, here I also want to highlight Richard Bramber's work, which uh, uh, he, he recently um, has published, which, which is, it compares how universities are perceived here with how they're perceived in the USA. Um, and while the view of universities overall is, is, is actually better in, in the UK, the issue of, of how uh, people can see they can benefit from a university how they can see they can benefit from a university, and that's the key thing, um, will affect how they perceive the university. And I think my, my, my final challenge to us, and I don't have a solution to this, so please don't ask me, but I'm hoping some of you will, is how we can ensure that people understand what they are able to benefit and how we can be responsive to that without moving outside of our mission and not doing what we should do. Um, that I think is one of the things I'd like to see the network spending a bit of time on. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a huge question um, and it's, it's really important uh, in, in terms of this. My final point relates to Omar's um, uh, challenges and questions about uh, um, uh, social mobility, student, uh, uh, student diversity within universities and whether um, the impact that we can have if we do widen participation effectively, um, whether that will have an impact on place or not. Well, historically, it tended not to because the students would move away from their, their, their place and go, where would they go? Well, often they'd go to the big cities, in particular to London. Um, I think one of the challenges we have as universities is to work in that economic space. So, so in my, my region, for example, just to give you an example, 90%, I know, of our businesses in, in, in Greater Lincolnshire are SMEs. Now, most of those uh, uh, organizations uh, will, will not take many graduates. So we have a role and a responsibility to work with our local economies to ensure that there are the kinds of jobs that our graduates uh, would rightly uh, want to take up. Uh, and that is how I think we can develop our place together. So thank you very much, Richard. Thank you, Mary. Th thanks to all of you for your, uh, your opening comments. So much we can uh, dive into there. So I'm going to I'm going to try and manage uh, both the questions that are coming in, but also perhaps play back some of the uh, some of the themes which have been coming out, not only through your comments, but through the last two or three days as well. And I, I just want to start with something that in, in different ways you've you've all alluded to, um, which is around this challenge of how do universities engage with communities that they're not used to engaging with um, and perhaps the more disadvantaged communities it picks up. Um, Marion's question um, in the uh, in the Q and A there. I think we've all recognised that perceptions of universities um, are are quite uneven. They're quite uneven within our regions. There are groups we're used to engaging with. There are groups that it's really difficult for us to engage with. And um, equally, if we're going to really have a civic impact and be recognised for our civic impact, we need to change perceptions we need to broaden. I just wonder, wonder if there's any more reflections. Mary, I know you said you didn't really have the answer on this, so I'm not, um, I'm not going to ask for a simple answer on this, but I just wonder any, any reflections. I, I, I might come initially back to, to Omar, but also just whether um, from the work that you're doing or maybe the, 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 the work that's going on in, in Manchester with such a big network of organisations, are, are there any pointers for us in how we can do this better? Sorry, Nancy, you go first and I'll, I'll follow. Oh, OK, just very briefly, I, I, I think there are um, two ways. Firstly, 
creating spaces within our university where everybody is welcome. Um, we're fortunate to have a art gallery and museum and actually with interesting demographics, but actually you need to go out. You need to go out to local communities in their space. Uh, and, and I do think that this has been led the way by something that was funded by government actually, the Beacons for Public Engagement uh, that were awarded and were very successful in following on from that, the National Centre for Public Engagement, which looked at different ways to engage. And one other comment is engaging on their terms. In other words, what do the local people near our university want to hear about? And on one term we found that, that is just ubiquitous is creative. Every part of every community have people who sing, who dance, who paint, who, who uh, and, and that's a, a sort of a quite a, a, a common theme. But I think you've got to choose multiple ways and not just come to our university because many of them, and, and, and finally, one of the dis things that disappointed me most was talking in a very disadvantaged school, very locally. And I asked if many of the kids wanted to go to university and they said, oh, yes, please. And I said, do you want to come to my university? They went, oh no, that's for posh people. And I was devastated, but it was true. Thanks. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Omar. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I endorse all of that. I think one thing, one other point, I, I, in general, I think in terms of tackling inequality, both in higher education, whether it's access, or whether it's experience or whether it's outreach work of this kind, there's a tendency to sort of say, well, we've thrown open the doors. Uh, why aren't people coming in? Uh, rather than say, like, as Nancy says, you need to, to, to go uh, to where people are at, right? Um, you know, just saying that, um, well, how do we change people so that they better fit in the space that we've got? How do we change our space or go to a different space uh, to meet people where they are so they all feel like they can equally participate and contribute? Uh, I did want to flag one thing. It was in a previous role that I did think had some prospects, not least it was partly funded by UK Haraya, David, which was uh, activities. I think the impact agenda, actually, for all of the criticism of the REF and that does offer scope to do some of what Nancy was saying as well. So in addition to, I think, university vice chancellors, I think a lot of academics are now going out more into communities and making those links with charities, making those links with community organizations, uh, trying to make sure that the research questions they ask aren't just translated um, for a local community, but maybe thinking about even in the design of the research questions before they apply to the SRC or the HRC. You know, do we need to change the methodology to ensure that we've engaged local people? I think those kinds of questions, obviously they're not gonna be relevant for all research questions. We need to pursue the right and the best research questions. But I think there's a lot of research questions, particularly around you know, uh, inequality, particularly around community cohesion, to use an old fashioned word, uh, but even in terms of tackling inequality, that, that probably could do more um, to think about, you know, that engagement piece. And then, you know, one good upshot of it is you'll get a good mark in the ref um, if, that, if that's, uh, if that's uh, in, not inspiring enough to do it on its own terms. Of course, um, I think that's... Mary, I... Sorry, David, yeah. Uh, of course, I think that's important. I, can, can I say, I, I, I build in the last two and say, yes, uh, alignment. Uh, I think... Uh, there's plenty of academics who feel passionately about this. Giving them the opportunity to channel their work is, is helpful. I think, and that's not just in the social sciences. I think we've got a, a commitment to, uh, and this aligns with, with uh, public engagement uh, as, as well. We've got a commitment to support and widening participation. We've got a commitment to support schools and science. Uh, I, many, many schools are crying out for input from their local universities to support their science because their teachers are stressed and, and not sometimes not, not quite uh, so experienced. So, so I think there's natural ways of bringing this about. I do think you need somebody attempting to coordinate this in a university. Uh, that doesn't cost much money to, to do a coordination function. It does worry me sometimes when there's a crunch in universities, the acts, the uh, discretionary activities like that because it's a soft way of doing it. So I think there's got to be a commitment to universities uh, to provide uh, support for the relatively cheap activities, although you know, I understand that they will impose time and cost in, in others, but we've got, to, we've got to take those responsibilities seriously. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to take this on. I'll, I'll come to you, Mary, if it's okay first on the next one. It, the question from Simon Collinson, um, I think, takes this on, on a, to a, 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 a step further, which is really looking at um, the extent to which um, upskilling among lower skilled, lower income communities uh, can improve productivity and inclusivity. And do we need to recognize that 
more explicitly what role can universities play in supporting that i guess this is one of those areas where actually bringing people together around a more coherent skills strategy is really hard but mary, mary what's your experience of, of that um thanks richard well you know i think i think this is um a, a huge agenda i'd, I'd again it, it's it's probably better to use examples um because they're real life so, so one of the things I'm enormously proud of, um, uh, because it is it is hard, because their um, their raison d'être and the way their their culture has developed over over many years is very different to a university culture, is that we have established working with all our further education colleges across the whole of Greater Lincolnshire, an Institute of Technology. Now, now, one of the things that's very exciting about this is that the focus for the Institute of Technology is on industrial digitalization and therefore the transformation of our economy, um, which is taking place um, in businesses all over the place. As, as we know, um, uh, many of, of the workforce are older learners who came into um, uh, industries uh, perhaps through an apprenticeship route, and who don't have higher qualifications. The opportunity to work with our FE partners, with our research knowledge around industrial digitalization, with uh, large employers who are doing it, um, uh, but delivered through further education at, at level four, is it's a huge opportunity and it, it, it takes that agenda to a very, very different level. And it is exactly what one should be doing around developing places together. It's not that we should necessarily be doing that work. Our further education uh, colleagues are much better in many ways at working with adult students who have come through that more uh, um, vocational apprenticeship route uh, and have been out of education for a very long time. But the expertise that we can bring is 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 through our, our, our knowledge and 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 if you like where where the the, the development uh, for those businesses is going to go, um, and then yes, uh, David's point about you then bring them into the university, give them access to the facilities that you have that our FE partners might not have, and so it's it's a it's a whole system uh, of working through that skill development. And I, I think this, I mean, this theme around bringing the skills system together at a local level is one that's come up consistently through the last year. I think it's something we're, we're thinking about. I know, Nancy, in Manchester, you're doing a, a lot of thinking. Of, you've talked about bringing together um, universities and FE, but I, it, it's, it's hard not to observe that at the moment, um, some of the messages coming from government don't don't feel like they're necessarily really driving and supporting that kind of collaboration. I just, I'm going to take this just a little bit wider, but I'd, Nancy, I'll perhaps come to you first on this. One of the themes that has come through the last two or three days is whether um, whether the civic role of universities and, and the kind of themes we're talking about are a way of the university sector trying to reposition itself with government and to tell a different story about the role and contribution of universities to, um, to levelling up both both locally and nationally. I just wonder from, from your perspective, and I'll, I'll invite others to comment as well. Is this something that as a sector, is this an agenda that as a sector we need to be telling a more coherent story to government on? Yes, definitely. Um, I, I have no doubt that we haven't been very good at telling the stories of what we do beyond, above and beyond research and teaching whether that's economic delivery to our region. Um, uh, many of our regions will have suffered dreadfully during COVID for a huge range of reasons. One of which is there haven't been any students there. Um, I'm sure it's true in other areas, but taxi drivers are going bankrupt because students are not using them. Um, so, I mean, that's just one very simple economic argument, but you know, we, we need to count up how many hours of volunteering, do, not just our staff, but our students do. Now, throughout this pandemic, all of our students have done thousands and thousands of hours of visiting people alone, of taking groceries, never mind the institutional activities that we do. And, and I just don't think we've been good enough at explaining that and telling that story. 
But it, it, yeah, I, others, I mean, it, sorry, yeah, I, Omar, please. Yeah, please. I wanted to come in. I think, um, you know, one of the things I find quite interesting is in some of the, the value survey where they talk about attitudes uh, across groups as being an education effect. And I think it's not simply an education effect, i.e. it's not that um, graduates are more likely to read anti-racist texts. It's rather that in a society where we have relative levels of clustering or segregation across class and ethnicity, uh, universities are one of the few places where people meet people from different backgrounds from those uh, you know the, that they grew up with that their parents know as friends in their local neighborhoods you know and all localities in Britain have this sort of division at a local neighborhood uh, area level um, and one of the things I think would be quite interesting is trying to determine you know uh, there is some evidence for example from the US that when you mix, uh, young people from in different dormitories that it actually uh, reduces di social division. Now, I think, first of all, universities in the UK need to demonstrate, is that true? And, and, and you know, do we know if that works? And obviously, we have a different kind of residential experience than the United States. But I think the second thing is, can we learn from that to try to tackle the other divisions that we've got in our society? Because, of course, non-graduates are not attending university by definition. Um, but anything that's working effectively in the university experience that tackles some of these social divisions should be rolled out more generally, I would say, in the UK so that we can, we can, we can address what is increasingly, you know, becoming a concern about social division. Um, David, I mean, you, you, you see a lot of the tensions playing out day to day in, in um, government policy and government relations. I, any reflections from, from where you sit on um, on, on how HE engages with government around the civic agenda? Uh, well, I think the big problem is that HE primarily engages with government, uh, deploying criticism as uh, the main tool. And I, 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 far be it from me to stop anyone from, uh, uh, from saying what they think, but I think you do, it even I sometimes, when I'm being controversial, have to realise uh, that uh, perhaps your audience don't appreciate it and don't hinder them from uh, uh, looking at some of the other things you say. So I, I do, uh, this is very difficult when government is doing uh, some, to put it mildly, very challenging things around freedom of speech and the like. I think it's difficult to put that to one side and try and build a relationship. But I do think it's the only the way. And I think actually it's something that universities were far better at uh, 10 years or more ago, uh, I think uh, a lot, perhaps it's unfortunate that a lot of relationships uh, with government do depend on personal contacts and a lot of those personal contacts have, have broken down uh, and the pan uh, pandemic is a very big problem and one, one of our standard lines for getting uh, ministers to be sympathetic was just to get them to a university and get them face to face with students and ordinary academics, uh, you know, who are t very often passionately committed uh, to what they do. They don't want to hear from vice chancellors, they do in other uh, capacities. So I, I, I think we might have to just bite our tongue sometimes or accept that uh, we've got to be less barbed in what we say in order to, to buy some space. But I'm, I'm trying not to put that in terms of we shouldn't stand up for what we believe, but there are ways of standing up for what we believe and ways of not. Thank you. Um, Sorry, can I just we, add something yeah, to that, please, David? Yeah. Because I think in the current time of polarized arguments, one of the things universities should do themselves, but should teach their students and everybody else to do is to disagree well. And that was a comment from a student uh, after a debate with two very different views on Palestine and Israel. But disagreeing well is something that we need to rethink about. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, more questions coming in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move, uh, I'm gonna move around a few of these. Much. I'm just gonna um, skip for a, a brief change of perspective to um, Kevin Richardson's question from just um, a few minutes ago, um, which picked up the session yesterday on civic universities uh, around the world. And um, we've talked uh, a lot in this session and through the conference about learning from our experience within different parts of the UK. Um, but um, what can we what can we learn from elsewhere? Perhaps, Mary. I mean, you you've thought a lot about this agenda and, and work. I'm sure seen multiple examples. What do we do enough to um, to learn from other countries, and how could we do that better? 
No, and I, I don't think we do actually, Richard. Um, and, and, and what I'm going to do is reflect back something that someone um, from uh, uh, an Australian university actually said to me, um, that uh, they, they were sick of, of, of UK um, academics and, and university leaders um, saying, come visit us and them never going there. And, and that, that, you know, um, there, there is a, a, a tendency for us to think we, um, we can't learn from, from others enough. And that doesn't, that doesn't apply in, you know, research groups where people work with people from, from all over the world. Um, but when we are talking about things like civic universities, as Kevin was, was, was referring to, um, you know, actually, I, I don't think we, we, we use the techniques and, and, and the approaches that, that we have within research uh, at, at, at a senior level um, in terms of thinking about these things. And I, 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 I feel my, um, my experience of, of, of growing up and, and, and working uh, in South Africa uh, has been hugely beneficial throughout my life and, and actually has shaped my approach to working in communities very, very deeply. I also think that I've learned so much from colleagues in Australia and indeed the US. Um, their systems are similar, but they're not quite the same, but they are similar enough and different enough for us to actually learn. Um, and I think, you know, one of the key things, um, you know, Omar talked a, a bit about the research in, in, in the US, there is a wealth of research from the US, particularly around issues of, of, of uh, diversity, um, uh, issues of, of, of inclusion, that, that I don't think people touch nearly enough in, 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 in this country. So, so no, I think there's a lot more we can learn. Um, uh, you know, service education in the States, um, the whole thing uh, around how you engage your student uh, community beyond um, only, you know, volunteering is terribly important, but there's so much more your students at, you know, this, the movement in South Africa at the moment of, of students as leaders um, is, is one for me, which I find hugely exciting. They are bringing the agendas uh, and challenging um, their university management in the most remarkable way. Uh, and I, I think there's so much more we can learn in that way. I'll shut up now. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think this this is a really rich theme for the network over the, over the period ahead. I think it's already building some momentum. Any comments from others on on international experience and um, what, what more we should do there, David? Uh, yes, I, I do think we we we've got to put some uh, time and effort into it. I I, I mean, in the, before the pandemic, I visited uh, Stanford, Berkeley, MIT, uh, Harvard. Prague Technical University and Oslo Met. Uh, uh, those are the ones that just come to mind. I, I think it was a lot of scholars. And the number one thing to learn was how similar they all were. Uh, you, I, I do mean by sitting, listening to students talking, not listening to the university management, how common the university experience is. But equally, one can identify uh, clear differences. And, and Mary uh, mentioned some of the ones. Uh, two things I'd say, uh, it would have benefited me to visit at some broader US universities than the four I mentioned, which are all of a certain uh, kind, but then Prague Technical and Oslo Met weren't. Uh, I think you've got to spend time working out not what you see the students doing on a day by day basis, which is sitting studying in the same way that ours do in small groups in libraries most of the time, uh, but to, to understand how the students are spending and uh, doing other stuff and how the university is reaching out to the community. That's a pretty time consuming. Uh, things do. I'd also say I've had a lot of interactions recently with South Africa and probably because of the challenges they've been through, they have thought things through at a much deeper level than in my experience we have here. And, and indeed some of the debate that's going on around at Civic is, to be honest, quite trite and simplistic because it's not informed uh, by them and we've not had to go through uh, what they've had uh, to go through. I also think it's it's 
it's worth talking to people in Northern Ireland who have been through a different kind of difficult uh, period. And to me, bring insights, which uh, often they won't talk about publicly, uh, but if you can uh, speak to them privately, uh, you can uh, learn a lot about working in a divided community, uh, essentially. So I think there, there is lots to learn. I mean, I, Kevin, who posed the question, has spent time in the States. He's brought that back and shared it with me, and it's tremendously helpful. Uh, but I think that's just scratching the surface, well, both for Kevin, but more particularly for the rest of us. Thanks. I'm going to move on to, to a, a slightly different theme, and it, it draws from um, Keith Herman's question, and, it, and it's around um, I think in many ways it's, it's, it's around impact, it's around impact and sustainability. So um, Keith says, as regards to levelling up, it's easy to do gimmicks. How do we ensure that regions and places are structurally changed uh, to meet the future and create the kind of future that, that, that people want and need? And this challenge around the impact of civic activity, understanding the impact, being able to measure it, um, avoiding falling into the trap of league tables and, and so on. Really interested in, to get views from perhaps from all of you on how do we make sure that what we're trying to do through this agenda really makes a difference in the long term uh, and isn't just a you know a kind of one year wonder of of of, of, um, of activity. Who, who, who might who wants to start on that? Um, I'm happy Anthony. to comment. I, I mean, there are of course all sorts of measures, um, you know, educational attainment, inequality, etc. But actually, you've got to ask the people that you want to influence. I mean, that's why we started our civic university agreement with a poll of people of Manchester. What do you want of us? Uh, what's important to you? Now, most of the time we know or we think we know, but sometimes it actually surprises them. I shall never forget many years ago being told by a famous um, local councillor, and I shall never forget her because she always had bright purple hair. And she told me that 10 years before the University of Manchester had been like the Vatican. And I couldn't quite understand this. And she said, utterly impenetrable or utterly impenetrable uh, were actually the words. You could not walk across our campus. And that was really important to them. And so as a result, we opened up walkways and green spaces. That would not have been at the thought of being at the top of my agenda. So we've got to ask and listen. Yeah, no, it's a great message. Um, uh, who, who'd like to go next? But perhaps I'll just toss it in something unpopular. Uh, a bit of bureaucracy often does deliver, I'm afraid, and uh, making people produce case studies every seven years, which is not really, you know, all that often, uh, and do it systematically does does concentrate the mind. Uh, getting I'm in favour. Getting people to produce uh, our uh, innovation, higher education innovation fund strategies every three years. Uh, and occasionally challenge them a little bit uh, and get them to write uh, pretty short pieces every year on how they spent the money. It's, I, I, I've really tried to make it something that we do do and insist on doing, but don't turn into a phenomenal burden. Sometimes I think I get a pushback from universities who don't realise the benefit that this activity has, and I accept it's got, uh, it's got a cost. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to not call it bureaucracy, but I think, you know, if we're going to measure whether or not structural change has happened, uh, we need local institutions that are strong and robust, not just universities. So we've talked quite a lot about universities of, as anchor institutions, about partnerships, but the project that I referred to earlier uh, that, that um, worked kind of with local people, one of the challenges of writing impact case studies is some of those local charities had closed because they only had three or four workers and they weren't you know, able to sustain themselves. So I think the sustainability question is not just, and, the, and, the, and having anchor local institutions that are, are sustainable is not just for universities, it's for the partners of universities. So I think universities could be making that argument. They could be thinking about when they are working with those institutions, how can they support those institutions to have a longer term uh, sustainability? I mean, if you look at things like whether it's Black Lives Matter or the Windrush injustice, those came up through kind of unorganized grassroots. And of course, that's a good thing. But part of the reason it had to come up through unorganized grassroots movements is because there isn't uh, strong grass, uh, you know, grassroots or institutional uh, organizations to tackle uh, racism in Britain. There aren't that many. Um, and, you know, it took a journalist to gather together the stories of Windrush as a, as a story, um, took journalists um, and of course activists, but it, 
I think with we need institutions so that they can help channel um, those voices and make sure that they uh, are sustainable at a, at a local uh, in a local way as well. Yeah, I, I would really want to um, absolutely uh, support that. I, 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 David, the, the, you know, you're not going to have any pushback from me in terms of the things you ask. Every every six or seven years is not that often, um, and and you know. Um, uh, the Hive strategy has been hugely important uh, uh, in terms of just getting the debate going within organizations. I, I, I think I think that matters. So internally, yes, all of that. But actually, if we're talking about places, it can't just be about what we do in the university. It has to be about seeing transformation within those places. And it, it needs to be seeing people's lives changing within those places. And, and so for me, part of, part of the discussion um, has to be about, uh, okay, so what is the place want and need? Nancy's absolutely right. You, you do need to ask your place, but actually part of that needs to be your local authorities taking some kind of a lead in terms of thinking about what that vision is, working with community groups, um, and, and then universities playing their part within that. And again, it's an outside in, take the measures from your place and put them in your institution about what you can do within that context. That to me is, is, is the best way to see things become more sustainable over a period of time. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that we're, we're drawing towards the last couple of questions. Probably, I do want to pick up a question which has been um, been in the Q and A for a little while um, around uh, the national research budget, and I think it would be remiss of me not to uh, not to pull that out. It's it's um, the Guild HE admin question: If local and regional research and development and levelling up objectives are to be met, should some of the national research budget be devolved? Uh, and would that enable or hinder the full diversity of the sector to deliver on levelling up? I feel I'm bound to come to you, David, but um, I, I will invite views from others as well, because I think it's, I know it's a question on which there's uh, a range of perspectives, but David, do you want to, do you want to start on that one? I, I, I mean, I find it quite challenging to jump to give us a pot of money to spend without teasing out some of the issues that we've previously talked about. If we're talking about substantial sums of money, and for example, Strength in Places is, is getting on towards substantial sums of money, projects 20 to 50 million. Uh, the bureaucracy from government that comes with that, uh, I wasn't trying to use bureaucracy necessarily in a negative term, but, but it is truly phenomenal. And I think uh, very, very hard work to delegate sums of money. And if you only end up uh, delegating small sums of money is a limit to what you can uh, you can achieve. So, but I think all of this needs to be super. Uh, first, you've got to tackle what are the obstacles that in our in our way to developing better R and D outcomes. Uh, what are the particular obstacles in different places? Because I believe horses for courses, as it were, they are different. And how is it that funding? is going to address that obstacle, or should I say, because you do have to change, you do have to do things with funding, uh, what, what do you need to put in place of which funding is one element in order to get satisfactory outcomes? I think some, uh, some regions, of, depending on how you use that term, have got their act together already on how they would deploy additional funding and uh, the support that goes with it effectively. Uh, but I'd say that others perhaps haven't yet. And we do need to answer those questions. The worst thing that could happen, uh, well, is to go back to the RDAs and the uh, perception, uh, I'm certainly not going to say this is fully justified, the perception that money that was devolved didn't get spent effectively. Now, at the very least, you've got to be able to demonstrate it has been spent effectively. Uh, you, uh, and, uh, so I, and the RDAs failed to do that and were caught in a political um, uh, cataclysm. So there's a whole load of questions to answer uh, before we get to, uh, uh, to delegation. And we've got to face up to the practicalities. Uh, the uh, ERDF was effectively delegated. Uh, that's proving a challenge, not for our part, my part of government now, but another part of government. So there, there's, uh, there's a lot of things to do better to talk about the obstacles and the benefits rather than uh, shoot from the hip. 
Thanks, David. I, I know, Nancy, you need to leave us at a uh, quarter past, um, and so I would just like to give you a, a, a chance um, yeah, thank, either thank to you. pick up this or for any final comments. Yeah, thank you, and, and apologies that I, I, I do have another meeting. I, I, I wouldn't disagree with David on any of this. I think my answer would be the fudge. It depends. Um, you know, what more could you gain from devolving? And actually, we take research in a very broad term. Um, and, and, and actually, I think there's more scope for devolving on, for what's a better word, D. And from that, I mean devol de uh, development and deployment or innovation or something. I think there's more scope there because there is more locality around innovation. Research, um, and, and what has to come with it is not just knowing it's well spent, but knowing it's well governed. And what's the payback for it beyond spreading out some money. Uh, the other comment I would make is is, is um, more uh, devolution or spreading of R&D will not alone lead to levelling up. It might be an important factor, and certainly I think the innovation part of it could be a very important factor. And if you look at regions that traditionally get very little funding, and I'd say here, you know, Teesside uh, that's very strong in some areas, Cumbria that's strong in some areas, South Wales that's strong in some areas, there, I think there's a different argument, but just saying we're going to carve up the research funding and give it to regions, I think will be di disastrous. Nancy, thank you. And, and, um, and apologies. And thank you again. And for, thank you very much. Um, Mary, I, th I wonder, what, do, you want, do you want to uh, pick this one up as well? Yeah, I, I would. I mean, I, it, it, for me, it's, it's not... Um, so it was very interesting to me that, that, that David did expand to talk about things like RDAs and, and um, in, increasingly, I think, in government LEPs as well, but they're currently under review, aren't they? Um, you know, the, 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 there is an issue um, about uh, uh, perception of that. Quite frankly, quite frankly, the University of Lincoln would not exist without LEP and RDA funding. Um, and I think that's a bloody good thing that we do exist. Um, but you know, uh, that's that's up to you, David. You can you can decide one way or the other in 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 your own mind. It it it. But I guess what I'm really trying to say is that I I think um, you can't separate out you know just the research budget or or, or just the um, other development type uh, budgets. You need to think in in the round about what a region needs. So I'm 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 actually going to end up by um, having been a little bit naughty in terms of what I said to David, defending him by saying, you know, it is it is actually a complex uh, picture, um, and there is money for places. Perhaps some places might might uh, you know we need to to think slightly differently about what places bring. Um, and and why we'd want to put more money there. Perhaps we need to do that thinking. Um, but but fundamentally, actually, um, I've always been a believer in uh, using other people's money and other people's resources to benefit my institution and, and my place. Uh, and and actually, we've been very effective at doing that. I I think I just retort by saying I don't think the University of Lincoln would be what it is today if all of the parties that have been involved in supporting it over quite a long period uh, hadn't uh, caught the vision. And we caught the vision because you and, and indeed some predecessors shared uh, the vision, uh, Mary. So it's, I think it's a great example of how things can come together. Can, can I just come in? It's a slightly different point, but I think it's important in thinking about the issue of, of leveling up, because I think one of the reasons we're, we're talking about this is not just lack of resource, but lack of voice, a perception that certain areas aren't heard, that certain kinds of people don't get heard in the national discourse or uh, don't get a say in what happens locally. And I think one of the evidence from, and, and, and this sort of links to civil, civic university is there is evidence, I think, that having local revenue raising power does make people feel more democratically engaged. So that's not necessarily an argument for devolving research funding, but certainly an argument for devolving more revenue raising powers for local authorities and local people who might then be able better to support University of Lincoln and other local um, universities. So I, I, I think the devolution argument is very strong when you start looking at things like participation, engagement, equal voice, and democracy. And, you know, obviously some research decisions, we don't want to be fully subject to the public will, but um, some we, we might. I, I completely agree with you, Omar. I think you're, you're really right there as a, a chair of two um, 
town deal boards, uh, whatever, you know, the arguments about how the decisions were, were made. Um, uh, you, it is fantastic to see uh, local community groups having a role in deciding on, on, on things they can do in, in their place. Okay, I, um, I, I fear that, as I expected at the start of this session, time is a little bit against us and there's, uh, there's lots of comment in the chat. There's, um, there's, there's some questions which I hope we've at least uh, at least done some justice to, uh, even if we haven't um, picked up absolutely everything in the Q&A, but I'm going to have to um, draw this to, uh, towards a close. I'm just going to briefly invite um, Mary, Omar and David to just share any, uh, any final reflection, um, and, then I'll, and then I'll just uh, draw together with a few closing comments on the conference as a whole. But um, I'll take this, I'll swap the order around. So Mary, perhaps I can come to you first, just for any... Um, any final reflection? Well, I just want to thank everybody for, um, you know, and indeed looking at the chat, some some really great stuff in there. And, and, and thank you to everyone who's participated. Uh, I'm sorry I can't see all your faces. It's always better if you can see people. Um, hopefully next next time, uh, Richard, we can we can be face to face. I think this is an ongoing debate and, you know, we are not in a place where we have final solutions. And thank God for that, because I don't think I don't think that would be a good place to be. Um, I, I've, I've learned uh, quite a bit today and it's been great to, to, to hear. I think let's just keep, keep the dialogue and discussion going. Um, uh, doing things in our places is a vital part of what universities bring. Um, it's an exciting agenda and, and it's one that I think we should all be proud of and we just need to keep, keep working on it to get better. That's great. Uh, thank you, Mary. Um, Omar, I'll come to you next. Yeah, I, I just want to echo what, what Mary said. It's been a, a great um, panel. I've enjoyed my fellow panelists. I've, I've, I have been reading the chat. There's some interesting links there as well that I will try to follow up, including um, answering some of the questions that were asked of us, I think. Um, yeah, I, I think I want to say that it is really important and I think crucial that we are, uh, that yes, the tackling inequalities agenda that, that Tezo is set up to, uh, to deal with uh, does overlap and can inform a place-based agenda. Um, and I think we should highlight and reinforce and work harder to make those agendas overlap. But I think it's also the case that we should care about student inequalities regardless of whether or not they tackle some of these place-based problems. So I, I think, you know, it's a sort of plea that we can try to do both and, right? We should pursue policy objectives where they overlap and that's a good thing to see that. But sometimes objectives, even if they don't contribute to say place-based agenda, are still worth pursuing. And so Tezo is very keen and thinks that the place-based agenda can be part of tackling longstanding and persistent student inequalities and a what works agenda. Um, but I think we're going to we're going to be arguing and making the case for widening participation and tackling student inequalities, even if it doesn't uh, directly inform a place-based agenda. And I think universities should have that approach as, as well. Um, and in fact, all public institutions. But it was a great day. And thank you to, to everyone for participating. And thank you for inviting me. Thanks, Tomar. And uh, David, uh, come to you last. Uh, two things I pick up. We haven't talked much about uh, skills, and I'm glad actually because I don't think we've got the right uh, people uh, or time to, to to do the subject justice. And it annoys me when we pass the buck on to skills and uh, the skills system as being uh, the key element of the problem, and then do nothing about it. But we have an opportunity now with uh, the DFE proposals, which I think, uh, to put it diplomatically, are slightly challenging. But nevertheless, they do provide a, an attempt, I think, for us uh, to identify the issues there are around, uh, first of all, uh, uh, providing uh, highly skilled uh, graduates uh, to encourage companies to, to locate in places, but I think particularly in retaining people in their regions. Uh, I think the DFE uh, probably are not coming at this from a place direction, although I know it's, it is important to them. I think there's lots to contribute around how uh, they, any, any refocusing of tertiary education can work effectively with the, skill, with the place uh, agenda from the start, rather than trying to bolt it on. I think it isn't there at the start. Uh, so I strongly encourage that, because it's something that only uh, really you can do, not uh, people like uh, me, so encouraged uh, to, to do that. The other thing, Simon Collinson's made some useful comments in the uh, uh, in the Q and A 
about what having an economic development institute brings to the area, a, fo a focal point uh, for understanding, uh, both academic understanding and practical uh, application and for different partners. I'm more than ever convinced that something like that uh, replicated in a number of other areas is a critical factor in success for both leveling up and uh, place. And I'd really like to see that uh, come about. Thank you. David, thank you. Um, can I can I start by uh, just saying again a huge thank you to uh, you, Mary, uh, Omar, David, and of course to Nancy for for joining us and for giving us such a stimulating closing session for this conference. It's been great, and and I would personally echo uh, all those themes that you've highlighted at the end. This is um, you know this is a this is a journey that we're still on, and um, I really look forward to uh, working with 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 you and with others across uh, the network and beyond over the year ahead. I think also a huge thank you to those of you who are uh, participating in this session, but also to others who've participated in sessions over the last three days. Um, we have uh, had a huge amount of uh, energy and uh, enthusiasm. Um, I think, you know, this has been, as I said at the beginning, an extraordinary year in so many ways, but one uh, which has shown the importance of, of this agenda. And we, we really look forward to continuing the work of the network. Um, uh, just a few final comments moving on then to uh, the, the, some practicalities. So uh, I was going to say a poll will pop up on your screen uh, in a moment. It may already have done so, um, but a poll will pop up uh, with a couple of feedback questions to answer. Uh, and uh, we would really appreciate your feedback if you could take time to answer these. Uh, as, as Mary said, we would love to be in a position where we can do events like this face to face in future, and I'm sure that time will come. Um, but uh, nevertheless, um, within the constraints that we've been working in, we'd, we'd love to have some feedback on the session and we will send through to you by email over the next few days a conference feedback evaluation. Um, you can, of course, continue to engage with the conference on Twitter uh, using the handle and hashtags, which are also coming onto your screen now. Um, you can visit the conference uh, discussion board, the place space on Padlet, uh, and you can leave any feedback, but also examples of, of what's happening in, uh, in your institution uh, or your area, um, or also just any thoughts on what you'd like to see from the network in future. Um, I think, as most of you know, that session recordings have been made for all the sessions through the conference, and uh, they'll be on the Civic University website as well as the uh, the members area, which um, uh, which is free to join. Uh, and just finally, uh, if you don't already subscribe to the network newsletter, uh, you can sign up, and that will enable you to keep up to date with all the things that are going to be happening over the weeks and months ahead. And there are links to those uh, in the chat function. I think that just about draws us to a close. So I will just say once again, huge thanks uh, to our panelists, huge thanks to all of you. And uh, we very much look forward to seeing more of you uh, over the months ahead. Thank you.